Hello, and thank you for joining us for this special talk with Dr. Jean Clinton, understanding children's emotions in extraordinary times and how that makes you essential. While today's presentation has been inspired by the unfolding pandemic, it will also provide registered early childhood educators, or RECEs, with information that could prove useful following other stressful events. My name is Stacy Lapine. I'm the Council President at the College of Early Childhood Educators. I've been a proud early childhood educator for more than 30 years, and I'm currently the Senior Manager of the Early Years, Poverty Strategy, and Partnership Development Departments at the Durham District School Board. I'm particularly excited to introduce our featured guest today, as she is an internationally renowned expert and advocate for children's mental health. Dr. Jean Clinton is a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences at McMaster University in Hamilton. She is also on staff at McMaster Children's Hospital. Dr. Jean, as she likes to be called, is not only committed to ensuring that children's needs and voices are heard and respected, but she also brings her expertise in brain development and the crucial role relationships and connectedness play in that development. A warm welcome, Dr. Jean. It's so great to be here, Stacy. Thank you for the invitation. So welcome. I am so thrilled to be here with you at this most interesting time in our lives with uh, uh, COVID-19 um, uh, occupying our minds and everything about our lives and, and thinking about returning to, um, uh, to school and, and playing and loving being with the kids all over again. What I want to talk about today with you is really about how are the kids going to feel? We're going to talk about the kids' fears, but also parents have been going through an awful lot. You yourselves as parents have been going through a lot as you've been trying to balance. Am I, uh, am I an educator? Am I a mom? Am I a partner? How am I going to try and juggle all of those things? So I want to also look at what does it mean for you as RECEs <clears throat> dealing with the children's fears, the parents' worries, but most importantly, we're going to talk about how can you care for yourself? So what I want to do is start with a huge, huge thank you to you. You never get enough thank you for the work that you do. For those of you who have been reaching out to families while you've, um, uh, while we've been in this unprecedented time, um, uh, and for all the work that you do, you are the unsung heroes. You know, in my world, early childhood educators are the ones who are doing the most heavy lifting, building blocks of children's development development, building that brain, that love builds brains, you're helping those kids come in and be so excited about learning and loving and playing. So a huge, huge thank you to start off. So we're in the right mindset here. So I want you to stop and let's set our intention here for our time together. And I'd like you to think about, this is from my friend uh, uh, Stephen de Groot in the Brivia Consulting, we work together. And he invites us to think about what brought you to education in the first place? What are some of the things that keep you here as an educator of these little children? And what do you hope to accomplish with the children who are in your care? So just spend, 15, 20 seconds now, thinking about this, because when we think about why we came in the first place, it helps us when things get tough. So hopefully all your answers are, I came because the pay is just so extraordinary. I came here because you get lots of breaks, Nat. So, Many of you have heard me talk before, and you know that at the heart of all that I believe and all that I talk about and all that I care about is relationships. And we know that relationships absolutely matter. That when we have, as you see here, so many ages and stages of childhood and young people, we know that relationships are the ingredients that build the brain. 
We know that that little one down there with his big yawn and his papa there, that when they are interacting, that serve and return, that back and forth, that energy that is transferred between them literally sculpts the brain. We know that babies are born with all of their brain cells in the geography of the head of the skull where they should be, but it is the environmental influences that determine how those brains are going to wire up, what areas are going to get strong, big connections, healthy relationships, build those connections. So relationships matter. And I'm here to tell you that it's going to be so important that when everything starts coming back online, back in the classroom, that you think about relationships as a priority, not just between you and the children, but between you and each other as staff and you and parents. It's when we weave this net of relationship and caring that we get through crisis. So when I say relationships are so important, what I'm talking about is for our well-being. And I love the First Nations Mental Wellness Framework that you can see referenced here. And in that, a, a wellness framework, relationships are at the heart of it because it's about creating a balance. And when you have a sense of purpose, remember those questions that I started with. What brought you here? That sense of purpose. When you have hope, when you have a sense of belonging and meaning in your life, that's when you have mental wellness. And boy, oh boy, isn't that what we hope for our little ones who come into our care, that they have that sense of purpose, hope, belonging, and meaning. So we're here to talk about what is it going to be like when these kids come back in, when our little beauties are returning to us? They knew us very well before, but what's it going to be like for them now? Are they going to be full of fear as well as excitement? And what we know is that all of us have the same fear, and that's the fear of the unknown. But unlike us who may show our fear by saying, you know, I'm really scared, kids are going to express it through their behavior. They are going to come in with big feelings that for some of them, like my little um, grandson, uh, James, Jamie, is, are going to be big and he's going to say, I don't like that. That is upsetting me. And other ones who are going to hold that fear in and hold back in. But there are going to be big, big feelings. So the idea that I want to share with you is one that is not um, new to you. That you're so familiar with it. And that is acknowledging the feelings. It's so important that you acknowledge little one's feelings, that you don't say, no, no, don't be scared, don't be worried, it's just me, remember me. But we say, oh, this is all so new, you've been away from school and your friends for so long, you take your time, how can I help you? So give kids language for their emotion. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, you know, I want you to put yourself in, this, in, in the shoes of those little ones. And what we know is that the brain likes to get predictability. Where do kids' fears come from? It comes from that unknown. I don't know what this new pattern is. The brain is always seeking patterns. It wants predictability. And when we're coming back into school, when things are so changed, that is going to be creating a fearful experience in the kids. What is good is that relationship, relationship, relationship helps you with that. So when I'm thinking about kids going back into the program, some of the things I'm thinking and we'll talk about uh, uh, as well is thinking about recognizing that they may be feeling more anxious. So I've seen some great little videos sent out from childcare centers that have, when you come, you're going to be walking. There are these things on the, on, the, on the road that tell you how far apart you're going to be walking. 
and one center had their teacher had uh, was dressed normally, and then she put on her her uh, personal protective equipment and said, "See, I look different." But then she took it off, and they could see that. So when you give kids labels, uh, words for their feelings and their emotions, then they're much better able to deal with it. So feelings come from your brain, uh, feelings such as anxiety, that is, come from your brain saying, what is this? What is this? I don't recognize it. It's not the same. Now, some kids say, ah, who cares? They're easygoing. They just go with the flow. And others are going to be more sensitive. They're temperamentally, they use more energy to figure out those feelings and emotions. So I am really impressed. Here's a very busy slide, but it's worth taking a picture of. I am really very impressed with the work of uh, Mark Brackett. I happened to be able to do a, a webinar with him and it was, it was a real thrill for me. He's from the Yale Center for um, emotional, the study of emotional intelligence. And he has a mission for people starting from the work that we do with the early years, the littlest ones, to give permission to feel, but also to give lots of words and labels for that. So why? Why are feelings so important? And he talks about five really important areas. Think about this. Your feelings in absolutely influence your learning. If you're upset, if you're sick, if you're tired, if you're worried about a bully, if, as an example of this work that I'm doing with other kids, then you can't learn. Your emotions determine your decision-making. Your feelings have a huge influence on your relationships. How you hear somebody who makes a comment to you, your feelings are going, oh, are they making fun of me? Oh, are they? Oh, well, isn't that nice that they joke with me? Your relationships are so influenced by that. Your health and physical and mental health are affected as well as your creativity. So Mark Brackett has come up with this lovely, lovely um, mnemonic called RULER. And it's all about, he's written this book, Permission to Feel, which I highly recommend. But ruler is so great for us to be thinking about with our little ones. And that is the R is for recognize. Recognize you need to pause throughout the day and check in. What is my emotion? What am I experiencing now? What are you experiencing now as you think about going back to school? Are you thinking that you're anxious? Are you thinking that you're excited? Are you thinking that you're apprehensive? Are you thinking that you're terrified? What are you recognizing it? Then understand it. Be an emotional scientist. Help the kids understand that they are uh, have these emotions and that they can see where they come from. I was with my daughter and her twins, her two and a half year old twins last night. She also had a little five month old baby. And so I was down with many hands on deck. And uh, unfortunately, um, a, a toy that um, one, my, one of my little grandsons was playing with um, uh, slipped away. And the, my other grandson, who's got big, big feelings, he was so, so upset about it. And he said, I'm so upset that that toy has gone away. I want it. Go and get it. I want you to get it, mommy. But she couldn't go and get it. And she said, you know, I'm sorry you're feeling this way. I, we can't get that just now. Do you want mommy to help you? So he came up and he snuggled on mommy and she said, well, do you want me to sing a song? And she sang a song to him about, hello, my sadness. You're welcome to be here, but I like it when you go away too. And he then said, okay, I feel better now. Wow. An emotion scientist, he labeled why he was upset. He knew what he needed and he, um, uh, uh, and he got that resolved. I wish, I wish that um, some of the other people in my life had that ability to be an emotion scientist. Then there's also labeling, expressing and regulating. So you see, we can really help our kids as well as us as adults, as you'll hear again. So what can an educator do? And this is from an article by Glory Ressler. And what it says is uh, you need to be really thinking about the importance 
of building those relationships. And that is showing that you care, absolutely. But helping kids expand, play, expand their play, expect high, ex, have high expectations of them, to get along, to take turns, to, uh, to share, to be empathetic, all of that. When you're doing all of that, you're building their relationship, their capacities. So respond promptly to children's distress. You know, I've visited a number of childcare centers and it sometimes surprises me that children who are upset are allowed to just kind of wander without an adult coming up and trying to help them co-regulate. Respond promptly to children's distress. They need you. Kids cry because there's a reason for it. Treat each child individually and give them what they need to build a strong relationship. Understand, this is so important, that warm, reciprocal, and caring interactions are required for relationships to grow and to deepen. Also, be willing to share control with children in emotionally and developmentally appropriate ways. We see that so importantly in kids making choices. And let's think about the programs that, and practices that we have. Do we need to have them? We did a consultation many years ago with a center um, and uh, they never let the kids go down head first. And then we went in and various things we were talking about and they went, well, why is that? Why is that? That was an adult directed rule, not letting the kids develop the skill that they could. So giving the kids a little bit of, of, of control is so important. And focus on children's strengths and feelings in all of the interactions. So we have to remember that all behavior has a reason. Again, I'm not telling you in this webinar anything that you don't already know, but it's something nice to be able to to, to revisit this, I have, as many of you have, a profound belief that children will do well if they can. I've not met a child in my clinical practice or in my extensive network of families and, and people that I've lived and loved with all these years. I haven't come across a child who did not want to be happy and content. They will do well if they can, but so often they're lagging skills. So try and see the world from the child's perspective. They're having that meltdown, not because they're trying to slow your program down or what you want to do, but because they're overwhelmed with the feeling that they can't do it. They need your external structuring and help. Now, what have they experienced while they've been home? all these months through COVID. You know, my little guys last night, uh, Tommy at one point says to me, uh, says to his mommy, can I get close to Nana? So they are, they're out every day in their buggy and you know, with the baby in the snuggly, and they know that when somebody gets close, they keep their space. They keep their space. So they're not anxious per se, though I think that they have developed a little more anxiety. My daughter thinks so. Um, just because of the huge change in the exposure to different people. Anyway, what have they been through? We need to come with them with very soft eyes. So if we believe that stress is the underlying issue for most of the behavior, we'll seek to find that source. Rather than thinking we have to extinguish the behavior, I really want you to encourage you to think about the self-reg method of Stuart Shanker and think about, is there a biological stressor going on here? Is the child hungry or upset because they're sick? Um, um, are they hot? Are they cold? Is there an emotional stressor? I'm expecting too much of them trying to get along with others in the pro-social or social domain. Or is the cognitive stress too high for them. If we can reframe their behavior as stress behavior, then we can come up with strategies to help them. So what might it look like? So a young child's response to stress may look like excessive daydreaming, disengagement, opposition, defiance, all of these things can, it can be how that young child expresses that discomfort that they have within them. And so it's our job as adults to really pay attention 
to the behavior and think this is where it's coming from is really more about stress than it is about misbehavior. It's stress behavior, not misbehavior. So now let's talk a little bit about parents' worries. So what are parents' top fears? Well, I could guess that they are, will my child be safe coming back? And then they're going to be, will my child be happy? These are the, the fears that parents have had always. But in these particular times, parents are also very much going to be worried about, is my child going to get sick with COVID-19? And wow, I'm opening my bubble up. So if my child is going to childcare, exposed to all of these other adults, do I have to change my bubble with my family and maybe my parents who are getting older? So here again, back to the same principle as I was talking about, where do parents' worries come from? They come from fear of the unknown. So what does that mean that you can do? You can send them along the, uh, the directives that are coming from public health to say, here is the way that we can make things safe. One, children getting COVID-19 is extraordinarily low. It's not, an, uh, it's not an illness that affects children predominantly. What we can do is we can have our kids in these cohorts of small numbers and they stay together and we're doing our hand washing, all of the directions that we're getting. Share these with parents, talk to them about their worries and about what it is that you are getting direction from in terms of public health that you are doing the best that you can and communication is absolutely key. So what is it that's propelling so much? It's fear of the unknown that is uncertainty that is propelling so much of that. So let's just talk a little bit about uncertainty because when you know about it, then you can be the boss of it. When you can name it, you can claim it, and you can tame it. So you guys who have heard me before have heard this before, but it really is that uncertainty creates act activation in areas of your brain that include your fight or flight um, uh, response system. So when we see a snake, there is a, a response that gets activated to get you ready to be safe. So that fight or flight response involves this, you're in a calm state, a stressful event happens, your amygdala, which is deep inside your brain, which I call the porcupine, sets out a whole series of signals and biochemical um, reactions that leads to releasing adrenaline and cortisol. Now your amygdala is a connected biochemically to your hippocampus, which is new learning and memory. So when your hippocampus sees the stressor, so if it's that snake, it says, run, 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 as fast as you can. And then once that stressor goes away, the prefrontal cortex becomes involved, the thinking, the higher order part of the brain to say, threat removed, just come back down to a calm state. So here's the beauteous thing about this for kids. We can be a co-regulator so that when they get stressed, we can come in and be their hippocampus and say, oh, look, that's not a snake. That is a cord. We can help them develop these skills. So one of the things I've learned over many years is that people think of stress and they think of, oh no, this is bad, this isn't good for us. But we have to reframe stress to say that, you know, there's lots of positive things that are stressful. You know, preparing for this talk is, uh, you know, I experience stress as I'm getting ready and hoping everything works and, and hoping I communicate effectively. So that's a positive stress. 
It's normal, it's typical, we have stress, anxiety, it goes up and then under normal circumstances it goes away. So that's like being dropped off at childcare. It's going to be a hard time for sure, but it's going to be normalized by the relationship that you create with the parents and with the children. So the next kind of stress is tolerable stress. That's more complicated, it's scary, it's challenging. That is, um, what do I do if somebody, um, if somebody come, walks too close to me, if the parents have been talking all the time about don't, be, don't walk close to each other, that then we've got, oh, it's okay, we're all together, we're in one group, it's safe for us to be together. By the way, just as you were gonna be talking about this later, I know Stacy, but um, I, if asked, will tell you that you cannot have toddlers playing together in uh, two feet apart. That we are really going to have to deal with our tolerable stress and recognize that little ones are going to play together. We can do lovely things like say, oh, you're playing with the Duplo, are you? Okay, there's a nice big space for you. Somebody is coming in along, you say, oh, let's make that space even bigger for all of you to be able to play. But when there is that tolerable stress, it's how the adults deal with it that counts. So that caring adult buffers the stress. The stress we worry most about is what you've heard me talk about as toxic stress. That's when there's severe, long-lasting, uncontrollable, or frequent stress. So that toxic stress is quite frankly something that I'm worried about that many children have been experiencing in these past number of, of months. And they may be little ones who come to the program and they are highly activated, that they are hard to reach, that they are going to need lots of music, uh, drumming, uh, they're not singing, you can do the singing outside, but you're going to have to be thinking about ways I'll, that I'll mention of how can you help them regulate. So you regulate first through the emotion and then you're able to use reason. But I worry a lot about toxic stress, but what we're learning is that even kids who have experienced toxic stress, when adults come in and do buffer that stress with co-regulation, by understanding, by acknowledging feelings, by reading stories about big feelings, then those children are able to move from toxic stress to tolerable stress. But what about our prolonged stress activation? What has it been like for us? I don't know about you guys, but I found these months pretty, pretty exhausting. I've been on an emotional roller coaster. Um, parents are going to come in and they're going to be exhausted. And it is, it's been a, a, our, our stress system that I've talked about, that adrenaline, the amygdala firing has been fired all the time because we don't know what's coming next. We're now into some kind of rhythm, many, many people, but now we're the summers, everything's changed. And now you're telling me what? That there's only going to be, a, a, there's going to be a different kind of way of returning to school. So... What am I, my point here is expect more fatigue. Don't beat yourself up because you're feeling fatigued. Expect and let parents know that being fatigued is absolutely understandable. Not having great focus. Oh man, do I ever know all about that? Expect irritability. So you're going to hear more of this from me. Be gentle with yourself and with others. So here we have a lovely picture, I hope, that you see of here are our parents, here are our kids. They're coming in with emotional reaction, dysregulation, and here you are as professionals. So you are going to be the co-regulator, that hippocampus that leads to calm regulation. What do we know for adults? Information, knowledge a feeling that you're being heard, that you're being understood, that people care about your perspective, all of those things you can build in your partnership with parents to help them with their anxieties and their worries. 
So where is this in the brain? Again, the limbic system deep inside is where the amygdala and the hippocampus are. That's our emotional center. And we know, just like the little kids are going to be anxious and fearful, we know that this uncertainty has played a huge role in the adult role in the adult world. So it means that we need to be making making positive and predictable as much as possible, making positive and predictable. So that is thinking about my emotional brain is firing here because I'm uncertain. How can I put parameters? How can I put protocols in place that can help my rational brain be the one that's in charge to keep you on track? So what do we know we need as our driving force? And this helps for parents. It helps for, um, for you as well. You as leaders, as educators can control whether kids feel safe. You can control whether they feel significant and also whether they feel situated. So what does that mean? So safe means how can you, these should be your priorities I'm suggesting as the kids are coming back and for the parents, that they feel safe emotionally, physically, that they feel significant. That is that they feel socially worthwhile, that they are, have a sense of belonging, that they matter. And situated means that there are clear expectations of them. They have a purpose, they have a direction. They know why they're coming to school, to be with their friends, to have fun. So these three great states we can create in our relationships, and we need to be thinking about how can we make it in our environments, that kids feel safe, that they feel significant, have a sense of belonging, and that they feel situated, that there are opportunities for them to play, expand, and to grow. So what's key here, absolutely, is communication. Communication to our parents, but also for us to stop and to think, you know, most people don't listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. So as you're talking, they're already thinking about how am I going to answer that question? How am I going to say what's going on? So really important to think about that. So what does all of this mean for you guys as the wonderful RECEs that you are? So number one, tool in your toolkit is to be prepared. I've been um, talking with my colleagues here in Hamilton and reading through. They have done a fabulous job of working with public health, with the city, with our professional resource center and supervisors to come up with as many protocols and examples of how things should go from all of those different perspectives. I can't imagine uh, not doing that because when, uh, for example, um, uh, you can't have wood chips uh, from public health might say, you can't have wood chips, but then the ECEs say, well, wait a second, it, the, the wood chips are ground covering. They're not, they're not sensory materials for play. Then you go, ah, now we have a joint. So thinking about the possibility, being prepared, make a video to go home or to go over with the kids, as I've, uh, as I've mentioned before. I really think, as I saw this with, um, with uh, 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 first responders in the ICU, that's where my son works, and they have a big picture of who the person is on their gown so that they're covered in the PPE, but the face of who the child, who the parent, who the teacher is, sorry, is, is, on the, is on the ground. What does it mean? Expect big feelings. Don't think that you're not doing a great job because you're not managing and containing all those feelings, but say you're doing a great job because the kids are feeling free to express all of them. I'm gonna to suggest to you that you focus exclusively on helping kids manage those huge feelings by being their co-regulator, 
by recognizing the brain is saying, I like certainty. And your role is to figure out how do I create that? So one of the techniques I've heard is uh, from one of the schools is be playful. Be playful in all that you do as the kids are coming into the school as an example. And one, uh, one center, I think in the Netherlands, was talking about how they had bubbles. They weren't blowing the bubbles, obviously, but they were springing the bubbles and the kids were following the bubbles on the way into the classroom. Or there were fun things along the way to get them from the door saying goodbye to mama and daddy without them being able to come in. What's the other thing? Have tons of blankets at that screening desk when the next teacher is there because you are going to need to pick up those kids, the ones who are needing soothing. Have the blanket as recommended and pick them up, be down at their level. Make sure that your number one job is to make them feel comfortable as they, as they come in. Manage those feelings. So why are we now going to talk about your well-being? Because what we know is that your well-being affects your relationship and the relationship that the kids have with you and that you have with other early childhood educators and with the parents. So we now have mounting evidence of the fact that the teacher creates the weather in the classroom. What does that mean? Well, it means that we really need to be thinking about relationships as the heart of the matter. And so here's another thing to think about. This is from my, again, from my friend Stephen DeGroote's work at Brevia Consulting. That when we have this focus on relationship, our own relationship to ourselves, which I'm going to be talking about, then we are able to help the kids regulate themselves. When they're able to regulate, then they're able to access resources. So they can go to something that makes them feel better. They can go to something that helps them get excited and they love. And what does that do? It builds resilience. It builds resilience. So the heart of the matter is relationship. So as we think about this before the last, uh, the last portion, I want, to, I want you to think about the Think, Feel, Act document. You know, many of you will have seen that. Um, uh, and uh, when we talked about Think, Feel, Act, we talked about the fact that our thinking really does affect our feeling, affects our acting. So, for example, say I gave um, um, uh, say I gave Stacy a call, and she didn't answer my call. Well, I could think, huh? Well, I guess I could think. Well, I guess Stacy's got another child psychiatrist that she wants to hang out with. So, how I feel is a bit offended. How I act is saying, ah, I'm not going to call Stacy again. Or what I think is, oh man, oh man, you know, Stacy's very thorough. She always. Um, answers back and how I feel is curious and a little bit concerned and how do I act I pick up the phone and say what's up how are you doing do you see the difference there how what we think affects how we feel affects how we act but you know another huge part of this triad is how we feel in the moment how we feel over the course of the day absolutely, remember connecting it back to Mark Brackett's work, absolutely affects how we think and affects how we act. So what's going to be really crucial is as the return to school happens, as childcare centers are opening more and more and more, we really need to examine how are you feeling about this? Because if you're not sure, if you haven't worked it through, it's going to affect how you think and how you act and how that is going to affect the little ones. So do not do it in isolation. It's so crucial that we listen to 
collaborate with public health, but there is a dialogue. It's not a dictating that you reach out to public health and say, listen, we want to really work this through. I've got some anxieties and fears. Can I talk to you about it? So it's all about that collaboration, all about how can I make what feels unpredictable more predictable, more moderate. That's how you manage stress. How can I control the things that I can control and do the best with them? So it's about time, you early childhood educators, to care for yourself. So here are some ideas about this. I'm going to kind of bump up the expectation here. And, you know, I've had lots of conversations with teachers over this period of time. And there are those who say that self-care, self-compassion, uh, you know what, that's not part of my job description. And, you know, that, that's kind of selfish. I'm here to look after kids. I'm here to be there for kids. I'm going to say, and I know this from myself, you know, saying self-compassion I don't even make it on the list instead of even at the bottom of the list when it comes to taking care of myself. So I think we need to shift the dialogue to say that we're not talking about self-care. We're talking about we care. That when you look out and after yourself, you're actually bringing a better self to your professional role. So this shift to think about we care, when I look after my own well-being, I am bringing my better self to the role of educator that I have. So this shift to bringing our best self has to be seen, I'm suggesting, more as a professional requirement. It's not selfish. It's not focusing just on yourself. It is absolutely making you a better early childhood educator. So what do you need to do about that? Well, you know, we've all heard so much about put your own mask on first, but it really is about lending the kids your calm. But you know what? Of all the adults I've spoken to over the years, many, many people have no idea where their calm is. They don't know where it is. How many of you, as you're listening here, can identify, where is my quiet space? Now, there's a difference between your quiet space, where you feel most calm, and what are some of the activities that you do to recharge yourself? I want you to think about, where do you go in your head, or if you're lucky enough, physically, to have a place that brings you calm. So there's no question for me going to the water. Now I grew up by the sea, I wonder if that influences it, but going to the water, even a lake, and just sitting and watching the waves come in and out and in and out is hugely calming for me. Now I have calming activities as well. I love to do handwork, uh, knitting um, and uh, stitching. That also generates peacefulness for me. But think about where is your calm? It's a, a hugely important thing for us as adults, particularly during these challenging times. And also, think about this question. When you are distressed with yourself, don't focus on asking, what's wrong with me? ask, what's going on with me? When you're seeing stuff happening with your peers, with your colleagues, don't ask what's wrong with them. Ask what's going on. Now, here are some strategies that you can take straight away. And this is from uh, School Mental Health Ontario which is a fabulous, if you, if you Google School Mental Health Ontario, COVID-19, you'll see some fantastic resources for teachers um, where there's all kinds of, all kinds of um, uh, suggestions. But I love this one. It talks about start. 
how can early RECEs deal with these times? Well, start with that calm place that I talked about. Where do you feel the most relaxed? The other thing is, make your body aware of what tension feels like, and then relax. Then do what I just did. That is, I tense, I just breathe. Another is a gratitude moment. I'm going to talk about gratitude again in just a second. And then stop the world and just notice. You can notice five things that you see, four things that you hear, three things that you feel or touch, two things that you smell, one thing that you taste. You see, when you focus your attention on these things, you're not thinking about all of the noise that's going on in your brain. You're recharging your brain. Just listen. Let it go. This is called radical acceptance. The things I cannot change, I have to let go. I just have to be in control of the things I can control. And then there's four finger affirmations. I am loved today. I believe in me. And then breathe, listen, smile, love, and tell yourself, I can handle this. I remember my friend Lois Saunders talking about uh, your attitude determines your altitude, how far you'll go. The last thing I want to share with you is this article from Psychology Today, and it's based on the work of Dr. Bruce Perry and neuroscience. So you'll see that down at the bottom, but there's also a great website there for mentalhealth.com. But here are things that are smart for the brain, that are smart for your well-being. And that is create, and we're going to have to think about this and renew all of this again, renew a daily routine. The brain wants predictability. The brain wants to know what is coming next. Also, sleep. It's so important to get uh, uh, adequate sleep. Now, it's funny that it's, we really don't want to sleep like a baby because I'll tell you, four and five months old, waking up a heck of a lot. So it's not the best picture, but you get the point. Run exercise, do whatever it is. What do we know when you do exercise, you release different neurotransmitter, miracle grow for the brain. Think about your health through these things. Find your calm we've talked about. Have rituals at home and at school. The opening circle that uh, you will have with your little ones can be that ritual of tell me about what you've been doing in all of these times. It can be not just a check-in or, or, or attendance, but really that ritual of, of breaking, breaking that psychic bread together. Reach out and help other people. We were not placed on this earth to walk alone. The science of gratitude that I'll finish with is showing us that when you reach out and help others, when you're thankful for what, others, uh, what you can do for others, it changes your brain. Limit your time on media. Say no more. Well, you know, one of the things that Bruce Perry talks about is the fact that if you've got CNN or, or some news network on the background at home, then the kids are hearing the cycle. We know that it's a repetitive cycle, but the kids think, oh my goodness, here's new bad news. So limit your media exposure. Well, everybody knows two hours before bed, you stop all of that stuff. And always remember, your focus determines your reality. Be future focused. We're all in this together. We're going to get through it. We know what we're able to do, and that is physically distance, but emotionally connect. So I'll finish now and say thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much for all that you do for the work that you're continuing to doing, for the lessons that we're going to learn from the hard way that you're working. And please think about having, whether it's a gratitude journal or just the intention of every day, several times a day, saying, I am so grateful. 
I am so grateful. I'm so grateful for the fact that I got to hold my babies yesterday. I'm so grateful that I've had the opportunity to spend this time here with you as our magnificent RECEs. I'm so thankful for the college. I'm so grateful for uh, creating this opportunity. And I'm so grateful that here I sit before you, healthy, happy, and excited to keep up the great work of changing the world by early childhood ruling. So I'll stop there and say thank you so much, guys. All the very best. Thank you so much, Dr. Jean, for a superbly engaging presentation. So much for us to um, reflect on professionally and personally. Uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to ask you some questions that we received via our social media channels a few weeks back. And by the way, thank you to everyone who submitted a question on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. We received many questions, so we know you were looking forward to Dr. Jean's talk. We're immensely grateful for your participation and your input. So now let's get started with a few of those questions. Question number one, Dr. Jean. So tell me, what are some of the best ways to keep kids physically distant, especially toddlers, while still encouraging them to socialize? Well, Stacy, as you can probably imagine, I think it's physically impossible to have toddlers uh, uh, stay apart all the time. And so I think that we need to have conversations with public health to say what's really reasonable um, here. We can set up play areas that are distant that the kids can play with. But what I worry about is if we're saying the priority is physical separation, then we're going to be spending our time all the time saying no, 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 no. And that is just not the right psychological message to be giving to kids. So set up areas where the kids can play independently as much as possible. Uh, give them the little prompts that, oh, here we're, go we're going to make this a bigger space if you're both going to be playing with Lego. Here's some over here. Here's some over here. But don't sweat the small stuff. Thank you. Our second question, how do we meet the emotional needs of a child while also respecting new protocols? Here are some examples. Limiting certain games, no indoor singing, changing how we comfort them, and welcoming or consoling them at drop-off should parents not be allowed to enter the childcare space? Well, I think, um, Stacy, these are fantastic questions. And I think the mindset of teachers, educators, first of all, has to be, I am looking after the emotional well-being of the children. So the fact that there may not be the same objects around in the school, the kids the, the, in, in the classrooms, the kids can ask about them and you just say, no, we don't have them anymore. Just be very matter of fact. When there's drop off as an example of drop off, I think we need to have lots of the, you know, the, the, the ministry and, and public health is saying you have to have a blanket to separate. And I think absolutely have the blanket, but pick up those kids. They're going to need consoling. And we know from the Netherlands and we know from Sweden and other places who have had their um, childcare um, uh, operating through these times that there just has not been an, uh, any, any challenges with this in terms of kids. Uh, one of the challenges I do think is going to be um, with uh, what the kids want to bring in from home. Um, uh, and, and how are you going to manage that? So I think to have a dialogue with the teacher and the parent ahead of time to say, well, what are the comfies? What are the, the things that the, the, the children uh, use? Um, so for example, soothers for, uh, for, um, uh, for sleep time. Uh, then I think that there have to be um, a, a protocol set in place about how they are bagged and put only in that one uh, uh, crib area. So it's all about the communication and the practice, but meeting the emotional needs of the kids first and foremost. Thank you. Our third question, Dr. Jean, based on recent COVID-19 experiences and possible trauma, how can we mitigate adverse childhood experience and how can we best include parents in these strategies? So the, I think the most important thing, and this isn't going to be new, uh, the most important thing is the predictability of the environment 
the building of the relationships and the allowing for, for, for big emotions to be expressed and managed. I think they're, the, they're the, really the, uh, the core foundations of being able to, uh, be, being able to deal with these, with these challenging times. I think, as I've mentioned already, communication with parents. Find out what has it been like. Ask the kids, what has it been like? What did they do well? What were some of the challenges? What are their fears and worries? I think we should have very, very deep conversations with parents about how they think things are going to be um, uh, most successful. They know their kids best. And so to respect that. And I, I'm hoping that the, 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 there will be a shift that parents and, and early childhood educators uh, form even more of a partnership around caring for kids. Beautiful, thank you. Our fourth question, Dr. Jean, what strategies do you have for building and strengthening relationships with children with new protocols in place? Well, I think the number one thing around new protocols is for the educators, for the staff to be comfortable with them and know them. So read through them lots, there's lots, there's lots and lots and lots of them. But how the kids are going to be comfortable with the protocol is going to be very, very much determined by how comfortable are the teachers with the protocol. So if when diapering, the, uh, a mask is used, if the teacher is protesting, talking about, I hate these masks, why do we have to wear them? They're going to be communicating that in their body language. Whereas if they say, you know, here we are, draw something on the mask here we are here's here's miss jean now um uh, you can't see her face but do you think do you think she's smiling <gasps> do you think she's laughing do you think she's you know if you make a game of it then that protocol is not going to be a big deal protocol around um around washing around washing hands i heard a great uh, idea of kids um, uh, putting a little stamp on their hands and telling them that they have to wash until that stamp goes away oh who can do it first who's going to do it longest so there's all kinds of ways that you can make protocols into fun activities with the kids and i think that's the mindset we have to have thank you and everything links back to relationships it surely does <laughs> So our last question for you today, Dr. Jean, what are some suggestions for explaining what COVID-19 is? And how do we respond to children's questions about the pandemic if they're anxious, scared, or showing behavior out of their normal character? Right, well, I think the, the, the best way um, to explain COVID-19, and there's the, um, uh, the Canadian Pediatric Society has got a nice little booklet um, uh, uh, that someone from BC, I think, drew about it, is that there, is, there are some germs that, um, uh, that sometimes make people sick, but we know what to do. We know that if we wash our hands and cough in our sleeve, you know, all of those things and don't touch your face, that you are not going to, that you're not going to get it. But what we know, and especially for our older little ones, what we know is that the more that we, the more that we attend to those things, the safer we're making absolutely everybody else. So the focus is not on, you might make somebody sick, but if we focus on doing these hand washing, all, all those things, then we're going to keep everybody safe. That has to be the focus of the attention and not so much on the, the, um, uh, the, the, negative, the negative aspects of it. That's how kids will be able to manage it. And then if little ones come up with fears specific to COVID, then what you absolutely want to do is listen, first of all listen 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 and that is ask them well tell me what do you think COVID-19 is tell me what are your big feelings about it or your what are you worried about so that you t you 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 tether your answer to their developmental stage and what their worry is about and so they say well I'm worried that if my touch my teacher touches me then I'm going to get sick and then I'm going to get my nana sick and so you say, oh, isn't it a good thing that your teacher and you got screened, we took your temperature and you're washing your hands and you're doing everything. So your Nana's not gonna get sick. No, she's not. 
So you do that kind of reassurance. Can you tell I'm a little focused on being a Nana? <laughs> I think it's great. Um, that's one thing I so appreciate is that uh, we get to hear your lived experiences come through in your presentations and it really resonates for many of us. So thank you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to share your insights with us uh, today. So fellow RECs, as you transition back into the workplace in these extraordinary times, we hope this talk has given you a renewed confidence in your abilities to help children and families transition back into childcare settings kindergarten and other environments. And as Dr. Jean um, has noted, it's also crucial for us to take care of ourselves, to be ready and able to care for and lead others. So remember, you're experienced and you're equipped to lead through change. The work you do as RACEs is essential and it's essential um, that we continue to do our great work. So go out and make our profession proud. Now, Dr. Jean, before we close, I want to take a moment to ask you about your new book, Love Builds Brains. Can you tell us about it? What deeper understanding will readers gain about brain development in the early years, and how can we get a copy? Right. Great. Well, I'm thrilled <laughs> to tell you about my latest, my very first book, which uh, is a product of many of you, RECEs in Ontario and uh, beyond, asking me to, um, uh, to write a book. So it is, um, it's about Love Builds Brains. It's a, a, actually a series of my the lectures um, uh, talking about attachment, talking about the early years. I also talk about adolescent brain and the digital world, uh, really a, a compilation of lots of stuff that's in this old noggin of mine uh, into, into book form. It will be, it will be ready for, um, uh, for, for uh, purchase in just a couple of weeks and you can uh, email tallpinespress at gmail.com and they will, uh, they will respond. Uh, so it's very exciting. Very exciting for me. Finally, I've, uh, I've had my five children and now I have a book and now my grandchildren are number five and growing. So we hope, yes, life is good, grateful. Dr. Jean, thanks again for your talk. It reminds us early childhood educators how essential we are and for providing us with some insight into how to handle the concerns that children, parents and educators themselves may be experiencing. And RECs out there, Thank you for watching. You can follow Dr. Jean on Twitter. Her handle is at Dr. Jean for Kids. I'm going to repeat that one more time for you. It's at Dr. Jean for Kids. Please send us feedback on this talk and any other ideas or questions you may have at practice at college-ece.ca. Again, that's practice at college-ece.ca. Don't forget to follow the College of Early Childhood Educators on Twitter and LinkedIn.